Okay. So thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, I will start. I will, what I will present is a kind of a model, very descriptive model that is informed by evolutionary biology and inspired by evolutionary biology uh, of how uh, we, we means uh, Simona and I, think about, uh, think about consciousness, approach the, uh, the, the question of how one can study consciousness. So here we are, the, the three of us, Simona, uh, Anna and myself. Anna is the person who did the drawings for the book and uh, the drawing and also is, uh, you will see some of her pictures here in color. So these pictures, I, I hope also uh, sort of introduce and uh, present some of the to uh, complicated topics in a way that uh, goes straight to the gut and to, them, and to our under, uh, aesthetic kind of sensibilities. Right, I start with a quotation by Merker he wrote about the origins of consciousness. He said, somewhere between Medusa and human, there is a transition to conscious function and the nature of the capacity it bestows has exercised psychology, neuroscience and cognitive studies virtually since their inception. I'm starting with this quotation because the basic approach that we are presenting is an evolutionary approach. We are assuming that consciousness evolved. That is, it is not all over the place. So my cup of tea here is not conscious. The only consciousness that we know of is biological consciousness. And we assume that consciousness evolved. And the way that we try to understand consciousness is to follow and understand the transition from non-conscious to conscious mode of being, conscious mode of living. Because there's, there are forms of living, we think, that are not conscious. And, there are, and since consciousness evolved, it evolved in living organisms. And there was at some point, or it, was, it could have been very gradual, but nevertheless, we, we, we should be able to recognize the transition from non-conscious to conscious organism. And what we do, and the way that we approach this question, the question of the how this transition happened, is by adopting the methodology employed by a great Hungarian uh, chemist, is one of the fathers of systems chemistry, Tibo Ganti, and by Milot Smith and Satmari, who are evolutionary biologists, when they studied the evolutionary origin of life. And what we do, and I will explain exactly what this means in the next few slides, is we look for something that we call an evolutionary marker of the transition to consciousness. Now, I will start with a definition of what an evolutionary marker is. If a transition happens, there is, we say, an evolutionary marker, which is a property such that when we find evidence of it, we have evidence that the evolutionary transition that we are interested in, whether it is the transition to life or the transition to consciousness, has, 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 been, has gone to completion. And the transition marker allows us to reverse engineer the system that enables it. So how do we find a transition marker? We start with a list of capacities. The list of capacities that, about which there is a consensus that once that a, a, an entity that displays this list has the mode of being in which we are interested. For example, it is alive. It has metabolism, it has growth, it is capable of uh, replication, it has closure, etc., etc., etc. We're looking at the minimal number of capacities that jointly are sufficient for defining the mode of being in which we are interested. And you take this list of capacities from the, lit from the relevant literature. It's a kind of consensus uh, list. And then one of this consensus list, and you say, well, this list is sufficient for, this, for characterizing the mode of being in which we're interested. You are looking for a single capacity that once it is in place, it entails the whole list. The whole list must be there if you have this one capacity. So in the case, for example, of life, according to Maynard Smith and Satmari and Gandhi before them, they sharpened and elaborated on this point, the transition marker, the capacity that requires that the whole list is in place 
is unlimited heredity. Unlimited heredity means that you have a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, 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 hereditary variation, many, many more than the kind of environments than, that could have been ever met during the uh, life of the organism and the existence of the lineage. Once you define and find a, a good transition marker, this marker is, marks the mode of being in which you are interested. And once you have it, you can sort of reverse engineer the kind of enabling conditions, the system that enables it. So this is the basic logic behind our, uh, our approach. First, define a list that is, that it will be generally agreed that it's, it's a good list for, uh, that it is sufficient for, this, for characterizing the uh, consciousness in our case. And then try to find a transition marker. And once you find the transition marker, try to see what, the, what this kind of transition marker requires in terms of the architecture of the system, of what kind of system architecture it requires. So we started with a list. And they, this are the kind of, uh, these are the uh, capacities that, uh, or attributes that are jointly, that are, they are part, partially overlapping, which is a good thing because they, <laughs> they, in, they are actually interacting uh, capacities. And they are jointly, we say that it would be generally agreed. We took it from uh, the literature in psychology, in neurobiology, in philosophy, philosophy of mind from many, many, many sources. And uh, what we're talking with the kind of characteristics are binding and unification. We see the apple as green and as round and uh, with, uh, other attributes all together. There is a global accessibility of broadcast. Uh, we have beliefs, we have multimodal integrations, we do generalizations and we, we sort of, and all these things come together and interact with uh, all kinds of uh, unconscious processes. We have, uh, the, uh, the, there is a capacity for selective attention and active exclusion. We have our attentional skills for selecting, uh, for selecting targets, uh, targets of perception, for shifting, uh, uh, shifting uh, attention, for maintaining attention, sustaining attention. There, intention, there is intentionality, aboutness, representation, which means uh, in our, uh, which means that, that there is some kind of mapping of body, of world and of action and their relations. There is integration through time, working memory, what James called the spacious present. The system has the ability for flexible evaluated, uh, evaluation and, they generate, uh, and, and it has goals. So there is prioritization of actions according to goals and physiological contexts. There is agency, this is, there is there is inherent activity. It's not a just a reactive system, it's a proactive system. There is embodiment, and here we mean that there is object-oriented spatial cognition that requires many degrees of freedom of movement. And this, there is registration of self and other and a stable perspective, a sense of body, of ownership, what Merkel calls an ego center. Now, it's a big list. And it's a demanding list. And some people will say, well, one thing implies another. We think that there, I, I will not go into a lot of discussion of this list. The, the, there are many overlaps between different aspects of this list, but there are also things that are not quite overlapping. And we think that if we find an entity like this somewhere uh, in, in some planet that has all, all these capacities, we will have a, a healthy suspicion that it might be a conscious entity. We will treat it with respect, I hope. So we started with this list and then we said, okay, what kind of single capacity is there that actually once it's in place, it, all these capacities will be in place too. Just one capacity that we can actually follow something that we are not describing in mentalistic terms because this is very, very difficult to follow, but we're describing it in some terms that allow us to study it scientifically very, very uh, in the kind, in the, in, in, in the kind without assuming the mental. 
And we were inspired by uh, Gandhi and Maynard Smith and Sat Murray, but we didn't start there. In fact, after a whole year of trying out a lot, a lot of things and having in the, and, the, and making a lot of uh, bad decisions, we, kept, we in, in, in the end ended up finding capacity that we thought uh, was able to actually mark uh, minimal consciousness. And this capacity, the, the, what we call the, the, the transition marker for minimal consciousness was, was something we call uh, was a learning capacity, which we called, which is a domain general learning capacity, which we called unlimited associative learning. And this unlimited associative learning, once it is in place, it requires that the whole list of capacities that I was talking about before must be in place, all of them. So what is this capacity? What do we mean by unlimited? Of course, unlimited is not unlimited in the mathematical sense. It is simply huge. It's a vast capacity for learning in a domain general uh, way about many, many, many things. And it entails specifically the ability to distinguish among novel compound patterns of stimuli and action, for example, discriminate between more or less desirable mates. For example, think about a female pe uh, uh, peahen that is looking at peacocks and she's comparing them and she's able to discern subtle differences between them. So she must see compound holes in order to be able to do that. And also learn different routes that lead to food and shelter and, avo and avoid similar, but dangerous routes, all these kind of things. The learned patterns must be novel. So they are not something that has been embedded uh, in, in the organism through phylogeny, and nor is it something that has already be, has been learned in the past. So the process of learning about this, making this distinction between this uh, the maze, for example, or learning new ways, is something that is new for the animal. Of course, it is based on a lot of things that are, uh, that pre-exist, but this particular, but this particular discrimination learning, and the particular ability to dis to distinguish between novel compound patterns of stimuli and action is novel for the animal. The animal must also be able to manifest second-order learning. That is, learn one once it learned one uh, some something and, and uh, uh, to do the once it learns the meaning, the relations of a complex image a new pattern of actions, this pattern can become associated with new compound patterns and allow the organism to build up chains of associated links. And the organism can learn even if there is a time gap between the neutral kind of complex stimulus and the reinforcement that follows it. So for example, this is called trace conditioning. So even if the sort of there is something that uh, some kind of compound uh, uh, pattern of sounds that predicts that something good or bad will happen. And there is a time gap between the, act the, the pattern that you hear and the predictive pattern and the actual reward or punishment, you are able to learn this. So you have to have something like working memory. You have to keep it in mind. And the, va the value of learned patterns can be flexibly changed. So the reward or punishment value of a particular stimulus or a particular action is not fixed. It can change when conditions change and it can be devalued. So something that was important for, uh, was good and tasty can become disgusting, for example, or can become, you can become indifferent for it. And it, uh, this uh, type of learning, and I will go back to this point later, enables goal-directed behavior. So an ability to understand that, particular, uh, that, that, that a particular action is related to a particular outcome and that this outcome is something that you want or you don't want. This is what we mean by goal-directed behavior. Now, what we so here is the basic logic of the argument. We have the list of capacities at the bottom, and this list of capacities is sufficient for the description of a system as subjectively experiencing minimally conscious system. 
And we had this unlimited associative learning I uh, described earlier, which in order for it to exist, this whole list has to be in place. All these capacities have to be in place. So it's very, very difficult to describe. To, it, it, once we are talking about unlimited associative learning, about a domain general kind of uh, uh, learning, we can start thinking about what exact, how, what kind of structures will be necessary, what kind of processes will be necessary to implement. It is much, much more difficult, of course, to do this with consciousness to directly. So when we were thinking about unlimited associative learning, we sort of created a small toy model. I will not go into this toy model, uh, uh, explain all the errors in this to toy model because it will take too much time. But what we have here are, we have, we have a color code. The blue code is the sensory uh, integrating units. When, what we mean by a sensory unit and SIU is sensory integrating units. What we mean by this, these are the units that take in sensory information from the world and also from the body and integrate it into some kind of neural maps. The yellow thing is the motor system, is, 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 the, is the maps that map prospective action, that map the pro programs of action of the organism. Uh, the, red, the red unit is the reinforcement unit. And it's a reinforcement unit that is not, that, 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 that is a dedicated kind of structure. So we have to have a structure that not only gives kind of value to a particular thing, but also is able to prioritize certain values with, uh, versus others. It is, it, 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 is a, it is a kind of dedicated evaluative structure. We also need a memory for compound patterns of activity and, or, and, sensory, and sensory patterns. We need something for invertebrates like a hippocampus where we, we, we have a kind of declarative memory, a memory of an event, not just bits and pieces. And all these things come together, uh, the sensory uh, maps and the motor maps and the, uh, uh, and the reinforcement and the memory of, of the past come together to form the, 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 uh, the come, uh, come together. And when they come together, and then they sort of, there is a down, uh, downward position, there is, they, they constrain and affect the process, uh, processes downstream. We have, this, we have this dynamic, but this dynamic creates what we call consciousness. This is our clay, this is, uh, it, it creates the ability for associative learning because we do association between motor and, and sensory patterns and we evaluate them and we base them on past memory and so on. And this is what this uh, figure is supposed to show. Uh, we, in order for this to happen, a lot of things that are not shown in the figure have to happen too. The, one of the few things that we did show is the organism have to make a distinction, a very basic distinction between, its own, uh, be, between the effects of its own actions and the effects of the same effects that are due to inputs that are independent of its action that come from the world. This is, this is called reafference. This is something very, very important, and it is related, as I will discuss very briefly later, to the ability for causal learning, to make a distinction because between what you have learned is the result of your own action and what you have learned that is the result of something that is independent of your own action, learned. So this kind of uh, system is the basic architecture the, the very very primitive architect uh, primitive description of the architecture that we think is uh, necessary for unlimited associative learning and this is the architecture we think that is implementing minimal uh, consciousness lots of things as i said don't go into it and we can discuss them if you want uh, later so here, just to make it a little bit more friendly, is the kind of uh, model of a toy model, if you want. Uh, 
kind of caricature of this uh, uh, very, very simple descriptive model that I described before. We have actions or, uh, or sensory stimuli which lead to sensory integration uh, that through multiple steps that are not shown here lead to sensory integration and uh, lead to, uh, and th there are actions that also have a sensory effect. There is reinforcement of this effect. These things come to a central kind of unit. They are affected and affect memory. They affect memory and are affected by past memory. And the double arrows are showing something like re-entered connections, reciprocal re-entered connection. It's the sensory motor reinforcement and memory processing unit. And the core and the central association unit is at the core of the network. And the, so this is not the computational model, as you obviously see, because the computational model would include explicit inhibitory and excitatory connections among neural maps and uh, different levels. So it will have to show hierarchy and it will include both synaptic and also intraneuronal epigenetic memory mechanisms at different levels of the neural hierarchy. So this is just a very, very general description, but it points to the kind of uh, to, 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 to the kind of general architecture that has to be in place. And what is important is that we have several kind of integrating units here, different integrating units here, the, the, the sensory, the motor, the reinforcement, the memory, and the, the, uh, the, uh, the central integrating, uh, associated integrating area. Okay, so this is, the, the one the uh, one of the things that we like about uh, unlimited associative learning is that this type of learning is a system property. We cannot reduce it neither to the sensory, nor to the motor, nor to the reinforcement, nor to the memory. System. So it, it is when these things come together within the right kind of, uh, of inter interaction that uh, unlimited associative learning is formed. And uh, what it requires, it requires processes and structures that it requires integration of sensory features to form compound configurations of world, of body and action and their relations. It requires hierarchical and recurrent mapping of the bo world, body and action generating stimuli into representation of the world, of the body and of prospective action and of their relations. It distinguishes between body generated and world generated stimuli reference on which the ability to distinguish between learned action outcome contingency and identical outcomes that are independent of one learned action is built. This is causal learning. It requires exclusion of irrelevant signals and, and focusing mechanisms, whether the, and it uh, requires dedicated memory system that stores event representation and a dedicated evaluative system to assign values to any compound input configuration and enables context sensitive prioritization through interaction with other systems. And the value of action outcome is learned in the system, in, in the way it's not pre-given. Now, all this system creates what we call mental representation. We call them, uh, we, we, we call this uh, representations categorizing sensory states because they categorize through their dynamics, both input and output. Uh, the, output the inputs that elicit the mental representation ca uh, capacities activate memory traces of other inputs of the same type. For example, inputs and memory traces related to hunger and to the satisfaction of hunger. And these inputs and traces determine what sort of type of responses will occur because there are memory traces of the motor responses to the inputs and the sensory motor and value neural representations that are associated with the attainment of the goal. They be, all this become active and interact with the motivational state of the individual. And when this happens, we say, this is the best approximation of what we can think of as a mental representation. And this gives us also a very strong uh, 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 this gives us a clue as to what, what the function of consciousness is. And this is a very Jamesian kind of, uh, of conclusion that comes from this description. It was not very surprisingly also influenced by William James. And James said, every actually existing consciousness seems to itself at any rate to be a fighter for ends. 
for which many, but for its presence, would not be ends at all. And we say the function of consciousness is to form a new realm of goals and values, goals that are driven by conscious intention to satisfy felt needs. This is the, goal, this is the function of consciousness. Now, if we have this idea, since UAL is really something that we can actually, that has certain properties, that you have to be able to learn certain things. Who in the living world, which organisms in the living world are capable of UAL? Now we looked, again, we spent uh, more than a year on, uh, on, uh, on, on, uh, on reviewing the existing liter uh, learning literature and trying to see which animals are capable of uh, something like UAL. Of course, not exactly because not the, 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 the literature is extremely patchy, but we found that uh, we could uh, that there are three uh, animal phyla that satisfy that that uh, uh, were some that some of the species that were studied actually can do you can uh, display UAL and these are a, a, a few mollusks the uh, cephalopods the octopus squid and cuttlefish uh, uh, some arthropods actually not very few, uh, quite a lot of arthropods and most vertebrates. We're saying most because not all of them were studied. So there are three groups where, uh, in which we see the ability for UAL and if you accept the logic of our argument, also of consciousness. And when we're looking at when this uh, phyla first appeared, we see that two of the through animal groups that show unlimited associative learning first appear in the Cumbrian 542 million years ago. And these are the vertebrates and the arthropods. And the cephalopod mollusks appeared 250 million years later. The mollusks also appeared dur during or before the Cumbrian, but uh, the cephalopod mollusks uh, evolved 250, uh, 300 million years ago, 250 million uh, years after uh, the Cambrian explosion. So it seems that UAL, unlimited associative learning, and by implication, uh, consciousness evolved three times independently, at least three times independently, about the groups, about uh, other groups, we simply know very, very little. Here, uh, what we see in this, uh, in this figure are all the animal phyla. And uh, the ones that have a kind of uh, uh, gray uh, circle with rays are the ones that show uh, that exhibit UAL. The ones that have only gray without the rays exhibit limited associative learning. They can they can learn by association, but they cannot do the whole range of things that uh, unlimited uh, that uh, uh, that unlimited associative learning animals are capable of. And the ones that have a circle have a central nervous system, and are uh, uh, but uh, and and those that uh, are vacant don't have a nervous system, as far as we know. Uh, well, have a, a nerve, Most of them have a nervous system, but don't have a central nervous system. Uh, and uh, the placozoa and the periphera, the sponges and the placozoa, the kind of amoeba-like multicellular organisms don't have a nervous system at all. So we can actually say something about when unlimited associative learning and by implication when uh, consciousness uh, evolved, if you accept the logic of the argument. And we can also say something about the evolution of unlimited associative learning. It is clear, uh, if we're looking, if we're thinking about learning and we're thinking about associative learning, we can see that, that the evolution of UAL was involved selection for the breadth of learning and involved complex multi-level cybernetic, new cybernetic architecture and the addition of new dedicated units. But if you are looking at the left side of the figure, which shows limited associative learning that is becoming transformed into unlimited associative learning, you see that there is a basic architectural core that is similar. So we have sensory units, you have motor units, we have reinforced something that is reinforcement, although it is very, very local. We have memory also, it's very, very local. 
and we have a kind of uh, and the and the interaction between the different units is going through intermediates where some of the uh, where the motor and the sensory and some of the sensory inputs are integrated so we we can think about uh, the evolution of the, we 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 can begin to understand the evolution of the uh, of unlimited associative learning required in uh, in, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the complexity of learning and on and what were the and what was already in place what enabled this uh, evolution to happen at all okay and uh, this so what we're saying is that there are, uh, that there was evolution of the sensory system and which allowed sensory discrimination there was dedicated uh, there was evolution of dedicated memory system that enabled some kind of declarative semantic memory there was dedication uh, there was evolution of the motor sensory uh, associations that allowed uh, that allowed uh, goal directed behavior and integrating reinforcement values areas that was also related to the ability to evaluate, to prioritize, and to change uh, the values of outcomes of behavior. And motor coordination was very, very important. The motor system has evolved and the maps that map action uh, evolved through evolution. So all this system, the evolution of all these systems was required, but the basis of this, uh, but the, the basic, but many of the basic units were in place and we can see them in uh, simplest uh, forms of learning. Now, this kind of, uh, uh, the, uh, this kind of model has many, many, has many predictions. If we're right about, uh, uh, about the, about UAL, if the, then we claim that it is, uh, we claim one of the, our claims is that UAL is a kind of natural cluster in the sense that the different elements of the, of the cluster group together. And this leads to the prediction that the elements are ontogenetically correlated. So the developmental studies are expected to show us that the, de the development of one ele element will facilitate uh, or enable the development of one or more of the other elements. This is a prediction of the model. We also would uh, we also predict that the elements of the UAL of UAL of unlimited associative learning are phylogenetically correlated. So if we found that a species has evolved one of the elements of this uh, unlimited associative learning, this increases the probability that the species have evolved the whole package. It doesn't it doesn't necessitate it. It increases the probability that it does. Why it doesn't necessitate it? This is because evolution is complex and there are all kinds of dissociations that are possible. But basically, this is a, a strong expectation of ours. We also expect that the, uh, the elements of unlimited associative learning will be medically correlated. So the brain injuries that affect one element will not leave the other elements completely unaffected, but may leave more limited forms of uh, learning unaffected. Again, we have to qualify this because during development, there is a lot, a lot of modularization happens to function in the brain, but nevertheless, we are expecting to find this kind of correlations there too. Now, the claim that the unlimited associative learning is a transition marker for the transition to consciousness, to minimal experience, leads to predictions that experimental protocols, such as backward masking, that selectively switch off conscious perception in humans, leaving unconscious perception in place, will selectively switch off the ability to learn an, in unlimited associative form, but leave more limited forms of learning in place. So if you mask complex stimuli and uh, new complex stimuli, and you, you ask the animal to discriminate them, it cannot do it in masking. It can do simple things in masking. Yes, under masking, but this things, the specific things that UAL requires will not be done under conditions of mask. masking, according to if we're, if we're right about the relationship between unlimited and consciousness. And we also expect that blind sight patients will be unable to perform unlimited associative learning tasks or stimuli presented to the blind region of the visual field, but may be capable of more limited forms of learning. 
And we expect that the neural signatures of subjective experiencing of consciousness in humans, whatever they turn to be, will be correlated with uh, unlimited associative learning. So that when you're looking at what happens in the brain during unlimited associative learning, you will see the same kind of neural signatures that you see during consciousness. Now, the, uh, the claim that this kind of system is possessed by most vertebrates, some arthropods and, choloid, and the, the choloid cephalopods in addition to humans, means that we should be able to find the same kind of results when we do uh, similar masking experiments in animals. So that in conditions equivalent to masking in humans, the animals will fail in, the, in tasks of UAL although they will be able to show simpler forms of learning. And I just want to highlight what kind of task we have in, uh, in mind. Spatial learning, discriminate, discrimination learning among different uh, uh, configurations, trace conditioning, reverse learning, motivational trade-off during decision-making, and recognition of causes and incentives. This kind of things we claim cannot be done uh, uh, creatures that don't have unlimited associative learning cannot do them, and and uh, and uh, under mask and under mask uh, under masking will not be able to do them. So you need consciousness for that. And I just want to give an example of uh, there are already experiments that are sort of uh, uh, supporting this conjecture. We know that uh, under masking humans. Uh, can, uh, cannot learn by trace conditioning, for example. And there was a recent experiment, very nice experiment done by Ben Chaim and his colleagues on uh, uh, rhesus macaques and, and adults. What subjects were required to do was to locate a target stimulus displayed uh, at one uh, of two locations on a screen. And preceding the target, there was a predictive cue that appeared on the opposite location to the target. So it's an incongruent uh, cue. These incongruent cues were presented either supraliminally or subliminally. Supraliminally means consciously. Subliminally means they were masked. The author hy hypothesized that conscious uh, perception would facilitate learning in macaques and humans. The subject showing uh, shown supraliminal conscious uh, cues, learning the incongruent rule and locating the target faster than uh, at chance level. Conversely, they hypothesized that stimuli that are perceived non-consciously, that are masked, would attract attention without facilitating learning because they're not conscious. And they will impair task performance against relative to control. And this is indeed what they found, in both macaques and in humans, which is very nice for us. It's just a recent experiment. As I said, there are not many, many experiments that are supporting our conjecture, but there's an increasing number of them. From in uh, of many many types, mainly it's done in humans, but but people are beginning to do it also on other animals. Now, this model of ours is a very general descriptive model of minimal consciousness. It is not committed to a particular neuron in implementation, and certainly it implies that it can be implemented in different ways. For example, in cephalopods, in arthropods, in vertebrates, and there are many vertebrates. Yes, fish are very different. From, uh, from mammals. So, and because it is very general, it can be used as a framework for comparing different models of consciousness. So I want to discuss very, very briefly, how long do I have? I have some time. I want okay. to so you, you have another um, eight minutes maybe, if that's okay. fine. Yeah, okay. thanks. Thank you. So I want to describe very, very briefly uh, the global uh, neural workspace model and the hedonic interface theory model. I will focus on the latter for two reasons. One, the main reason is because as with the UAL model, the evolution of learning is central to the uh, hedonic interface uh, theory. And the second is that it is most people don't know anything about it. And uh, it's uh, time that they did, <laughs> we think, <laughs> because it's interesting. Uh, okay, so here we have the global neural network model, and I color coded the relevant bits of the uh, of the processes that uh, Dehan, uh, that Chanjan Dehan has described in this uh, picture. 
in our code. So we have a perceptual system, the, the sensory integrating units, we have long-term memory, this is uh, in the case of uh, vertebrates hippocampus. We have the motor system, not only hippocampus, also other, other, bits in, uh, other areas of thought in the neocode in, in mammals. We have the evaluative system and we have the, uh, the integrating, the, the place where all these things come together, the, uh, the, the uh, global neural workspace, which has particular properties that allow the integration of all this. The difference between our model and, uh, and, this, uh, mo and this general description is that we don't have, the uh, UAL model doesn't have attentional systems that are dedicated. The attentional systems are local. And I'm wondering whether the, uh, the, uh, the need for attentional, for dedicated attentional system is uh, whether attention, the, the problem with attentional, uh, dedicated attentional system is it's very, very difficult to make distinction. It's not clear what they are. It's very, very difficult to distinguish between them and all kinds of executive reasons. In our model, we don't need them, but we do need the dedicated memory system. Maybe in some forms of, of uh, uh, unlimited associative learning in very complex types of associative learning, maybe in mammals, there is a need for such models. In the minimal model that we're presenting, there is no such. Need. So this is the difference. But nevertheless, it's very interesting that this, uh, we're talking basically about the same elements, exactly the same elements. So with the exception of dedicated attention motorworks, UAL architecture parallels the uh, global workspace model. And the basic architecture can be implemented without a cortex. This is not a necessary uh, condition. For example, if we're thinking about vertebrates, uh, Merker's egocenter, who Merker, Bjorn Merker, uh, had an egocenter model that can be thought of as an implementation of uh, the UAL, of something that is similar to UAL model with the kind of ego center that is constructed as the animal learns about the difference between its own learned action generated outcomes and the outcomes that are independent of instrumental learning and is, is motivated to, uh, to, to do things. And it is using all the time a particular perspective from which it is doing and comparing things in the world and its own actions. So it's, I'm not going, I will not go into it. I want to go a little bit more into the, um, uh, the uh, hedonic interface model because it is a, a model that, that focuses on memory and that assumes that the evolution, uh, that uh, uh, it, the basic assumption of this model is that the evolution of intentional control of goal-directed behavior rendered unconscious, consumatory reactions, such as, for example, the rejection reaction of the rat when it tastes something this, something that is um, like quinine, it renders it conscious. So something that a kind of motivational state that is unconscious is rendered conscious through the evolution of intentional control. And they identify con consciousness with hedonic or unhedonic feelings. For uh, we disagree with them uh, about, they, they see desires and perceptions as cognitive representation that are non-conscious. We disagree with them very profoundly, but we will not go into this uh, here. And, but uh, what, what is interesting about their model is that their model, that their hit model is a functional account of consciousness. And consciousness, according to them, is the outcome of the evolution of goal-directed behavior. And the function, of, uh, uh, of consciousness as they define it is as follows. They say, it is only with the evolution of intentional control of goal-directed action that there is a function for the feelings and affective reactions elicited by motivationally significant events. And this function is grounding the assignment of value to the outcomes of action in biologically relevant process. In our words, which are a little bit simpler, it means that current physiological needs become felt as they interact with representations of action outcome and outcome value, and this gu and guide immediate online decision making according to the 
current physiological state of the organs. And we reached a very similar conclusion on the, uh, on the basis of our functional, uh, of our uh, unlimited associative uh, uh, learning model. We, as we said before, for us, the goal, the function of consciousness is the formation of a new realm of goals and values, goals that are reached through conscious intention to satisfy felt needs. It's very, very similar, although we came to it from a completely different direction. May I just interrupt real quickly? The, so if you could um, wrap up in the next two minutes, that would be great. Then we still have a bit of time for discussion. Okay, so I will, okay. So I just want to say a few, uh, just to cl clarify again what goal-directed behavior is. Goal-directed behavior requires that the animal represent the conditional relation between action and, I and outcome, and that it represent the outcome as a goal for the agent. And goal-directed behavior is illustrated by, in, in, by behaviors of humans, monkeys, rats, and ravens. It was actually shown. And it is, a, and this kind of goal-directed behavior can be suppressed by habit. So if you do it something again, again, and again, and again, you don't have this kind of flexible control of intentional action. Now, since I have to wrap up, I will not show you the experiments that show this, unfortunately. But uh, all I can, I, I, I will wrap up by in, in, the, fall, in the next three slides. Non-conscious, uh, uh, okay. What, what goal-directed behavior does is it rapidly adapts the organism to new environment. It allows online rapid assessment and updating of action outcome value according to current physiological state. And this depends on interaction between memorized representations of action outcome and outcome value in the context of current physiological state. So in other words, the current physiological consumatory state of the organism become conscious when it interacts with these representations, representation of action outcome and outcome value. And it, and according to our way of thinking, this kind of uh, a hedonic interface model is implied or is a facet of unlimited associative learning. According to our to unlimited associative learning, when physiological states are contextualized and prioritized, they're experienced. So experiences are constituted by this interaction. However, according to our model, unlike the, the, hit, uh, the, uh, the hit model, Conscious states include those that are involved in perception, action execution, in seeking and in wanting. This, for us, are mental states par excellence. And there are feelings such as hedonic feelings uh, of pleasure or displeasure are not the only type of conscious states. Now, they, uh, uh, Dickinson and Balain, who developed this HIP model, have a prediction that animals that have cognitive abilities probably have qualia, and, sh uh, and they should pass the kind of tests that show that they actually have a, a goal-directed behavior, a particular kind of test that animals have, can, that, uh, that you can give to animals certain tasks, only animals that have goal-directed behavior can pass. This is called the Palermo, Palermo type test, never mind why because I didn't have time to explain this. And in fact, in our book, we also said that goal-directed behavior is one of the positive tests of unlimited associative learning. But we also have other predictions. So, uh, so that's it. So I will wrap up by saying that consciousness, according to us, is constituted and entailed by a particular form of biological implemented cognition that allows domain general open-ended learning and that the evolution of UAL of unlimited associative learning drove the evolution of consciousness and it evolved in different nervous systems at different times in parallel. And the function of consciousness is to generate a new realm of goals that are contingent on the satisfaction of felt needs and it allows goal-directed behavior. And that this the tasks of your, uh, the unlimited associative learning task can be achieved only with an organism. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. That was um, a very interesting and enlightening talk. Um, so we'll do it as in the other sessions. If you have a questions, please click on the raise hand symbol, um, which is just at the bottom of your screen um, in the reaction panel. Um, I'm just going to give everyone a quick chance um, to see if there's any question. Um, and in fact, there's a question in the chat. Oh, there's many questions. Um, yeah, so let's start with Vanya, because he actually invited you. Vanya, please go ahead. Thank you so much for your inspiring talk. Um, so I have two question, but, uh, questions, but I'll start with one and then see if there's still time or how, lo how long it takes. So um, the first question is about um, what, what do you think about minimal consciousness? Because um, if I understand, understand you correctly, um, UAL is sufficient for a minimal form of consciousness in the sense that it gives um, creatures a minimal form of working memory, a minimal form of a sense of self, and so on. Um, but as you know, there, there are people who would say, well, there are other types of minimal experience that do not have all of these features, for instance, that do not have a any form of uh, self-experience or, or, or selfhood. Um, so what, what do you think about this? What, would you agree that there are other types of minimal consciousness that may not have all of these features that you identify as sufficient for, for consciousness. Um, and um, could there even be other types of consciousness for which UAL is not necessary? Maybe even richer forms of consciousness for which um, UAL is, is not necessary either. Well, my, I, there, there are two things to say here. The first is that what we suggested is our sufficient uh, conditions for consciousness. And uh, this is, uh, and uh, UAL, unlimited associative learning, is a positive marker of consciousness. When you have it, you know that the animal is conscious. When you don't have it, you don't, you, you don't know that it is conscious, but you don't know that it is not conscious. Okay, so it is a positive marker only. However, we think that if an animal lacks, it, that this is the only thing, this is something that we can say with a certain degree of conviction. When people are talking about, uh, about uh, so this is the first thing. The second thing is when we're talking, we, it's very important to understand that we're talking about unlimited associative learning as a evolutionary marker. And it is important to understand that we're not talking about a, that, an, that an animal that doesn't display the UAL, but has the architecture of UAL, and of course it will be conscious. Ontogeny does not recapitulate phylogeny, okay? So it's, it's not, of course, a baby that has the UAL architecture. It has the ability to integrate sensory things. It has the ability to form maps. It has the ability to, re, to uh, for, 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 it has a dedicated memory system and all these things are active. It has, it has a, it, 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 is a, it is conscious, even though it cannot, it is not able to learn by, it doesn't, it doesn't have the memory reserves and the, uh, it, it, it didn't have the experiences of, in the past that allow associative learning of, 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 uh, of, of, of the complexity that we are demanding. So what we are saying is that UAL is an evolutionary marker. It is not an ontogenetic marker. And it is only a positive marker so that animals that display UAL, for sure, we say, yes, the likelihood is that they are conscious. We don't, there is a, always a very, in evolution, there is always a big gray area where you don't know whether an animal, you know, you have the same with the origin of life. You know when an when there when an animal is dis, when a system is displaying certain characteristics, a, a, a sufficiently large a assemble of character cluster of characteristics. You can say, well, yes, this is a living system. We would recognize this system in any planet 
in which uh, in which uh, in any in any planet we encounter. If something like that is found, we'll say it's alive. But what about if you only have some of this characteristic? And this is very very difficult because you are, this will depend very strongly on the particular uh, theory of consciousness that you that you hold. This is very theory dependent. For example, in the origin of life, there will be people that will say even very short uh, uh, DNA molecules are already alive because they can self-replicate. Whereas other people will, and, and because their, uh, their theory of life is focused on self-replication as a core property, right? Others will say, no, you need metabolism. You need something else. And others will say, you need the, the kind of interaction between this system for you to have a living system that is self that, that, that has some kind of persistence over time also, that will not just dis, uh, break down in a second. So it very, very much it, it will depend on your theory, on, on the particular theory and folk, uh, particular theoretical focus of your theory. What we were trying to do is to define, it's, it's not, of course, it's not a theory free kind of um, uh, uh, suggestion that we're doing. We, we think that uh, consciousness is something that uh, is uh, characterizing living organisms with a certain, uh, with a, with, with a certain, uh, with the nervous system, with the central nervous system, with a, and particular demand, and with, we have particular demands for this uh, central nervous system. So of course it's not a, a, a theory for you, but we, but we are agnostic at the moment about where exactly we can we, uh, about where we cannot be sure about the negative aspect. We cannot tell you which one, which animals for sure are not conscious. Of course, if an animal doesn't have any of these properties, or very very few of these properties, we will say, well, you know, probably not. So I would like to take one more question. Um, time is running out, um, but we should be able to do one more. So maybe um, since, oh, so the question's changed actually, someone pulled back. Okay, so I'm just gonna go with Andrew because you were first. Um, please go ahead. And if you would keep it short, then that would be great. Thank you very much. Sure, thanks very much uh, for the fascinating talk. Um, I had some problems with the original logic that you presented, uh, the, the list of capacities that you felt was, would suffice for consciousness. And I wondered whether the, the, the flaw here might be that you'd be prejudiced to finding animals that think like us and are conscious. Uh, in other words, uh, there might be other animals with phenomenal experience that don't think like us that we would completely miss. Um, could you comment? Yes, you know, I'm limited by my imagination, I'm afraid. And uh, I, we were trying not to think about humans as much as possible. We were trying to think about, we're not, uh, we, we were trying to think about behavior. We were trying to think about, uh, and we were trying to think about something that is, does not require the ability of humans to think uh, 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 for human representation. One of the things that we didn't require in this list is any kind of uh, second order uh, thought or higher order thought or thinking about thinking or something like that. This is completely missing. So we don't think that this is necessary. We are not, uh, we are certainly not, uh, uh, we, we, we don't, we are opposed, actually, to the high order, uh, uh, high order, uh, uh, high order theory, uh, thinking kind of mental uh, representation theory, and we don't think that this uh, is necessary. We think that uh, this primary, but but we think that primary experience does require very complex cybernetic architecture with multiple hierarchical levels but it does but this doesn't mean that you have to think about thinking or to know or to be aware of yourself as a thinking being or something like that so i don't think that we were using at all uh, humans as a, as a as a starting as a starting point except in that to some extent, our own experiences as biological creatures dictate the way that we, we look in, uh, at biology in general. And this we did not escape and we cannot escape. Okay. I mean, 
Yeah. <laughs> Lenor, Lenor, do you have a very quick one, which we might squeeze in like in a minute or two? You're still muted. Uh, so I want to thank you and just say that I just went out and bought on Amazon, uh, Avis and Simona's book. Um, yeah, so you have this evolutionary approach to consciousness that goes into, um, you know, some kind of maybe functional consciousness, and as you just sort of disclaimed, you're not really claiming phenomenal consciousness, though a lot of things you talk about really seem to be phenomenal-like, especially when you talk about HIT. Um, so question is, why does it have to be biological? Um, does it have to go through, now that you have put out these points, can a machine have a lot of these features that you have um, as these overlapping jointly sufficient attributes of consciousness? I can go through your list and sort of tell you, yeah, we can have a computer with all, like a machine with all of these properties. Um, why are you just focusing on the biological? I mean, that's the, does it have to be in your mind biological? Yes. So there are two answers to this. First of all, the only consciousness that we currently know about is biological consciousness. So it is a good idea to understand it. This sure. is the first answer. The second answer is that when we're thinking about consciousness, and we just wrote a paper about it, actually, can robot be sentient, as it's called. It's published in something called, I think, Robot, Senti a robot Consciousness Journal or something like that. Anyway, uh, yeah, so the, the point is that when we, you're thinking uh, about uh, unlimited associative learning and you're trying to implement and you're trying to see what does it mean to have this kind of very, very domain general thing that no I, robot today has. But the big problem is that no robot today can behave even as like see elegance. Sure. Like, uh, uh, I mean, this is completely uh, now. And you, you try to, to think, why is this the case? Is it because we don't have a lot, a lot, a lot of processors that can do a lot, a lot of different things? Is, it, is, it a, is, is there a lack of something that is unifying, such as, for example, the need for a, a, for a kind of value that unifies the system of a whole that in biological organism is survival and reproduction? Do you need to have this kind of, uh, some kind of unifying value for the whole system as a whole? And if you do need to have some value and you have to have also particular ways of accomplishing, of, uh, of uh, implementing this value, what does it mean? Does it mean, does it require a particular type of, for example, material uh, uh, embodiment? Do we need, as for example, Damasio uh, 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 claims to have a kind of vulnerability in the system, that the system will be extremely sensitive to the environment and will all the time uh, and all the time will respond to the environment. So do we have to have a kind of soft robot? Uh, and if, do we have also to have uh, the affordances that uh, development of ontogeny, morphological ontogeny, not just behavioral ontogeny, gives to an organism. It gives it enormous affordances. Is it possible to build a kind of a, a, of a robot that will manifest unlimited associative learning without it being made of soft materials, without it going through behavioral and ontogenetic uh, development, be, be, without it having a unifying uh, value system and so on. So we think you cannot do it. We don't say that you can't have a robot like this. We are not claiming this. We are only claiming that the robot that can do, that can be conscious and do, and if, if you, uh, and can have even, I don't know if, if it can, if it is conscious or not, but a robot that can accomplish UEL will have to have a lot of properties and a lot of affordances that biology gives us. Again, we are not saying this is impossible to build such a system. At the moment, we are not there at all. Of course, so it's only 15 years in evolution for robots and uh, millions for humans, right? So I think you can't compare a nanosecond or a microsecond with, in that sense. In fact, I mean, the robots today, obviously, I'm not uh, talking about but the potential of machine uh, consciousness, given a lot of the properties that you're outlining. Uh, okay. I think that uh, 
uh, that it is not uh, that you know that we have very very clever robots. But as I said, I, as far as I know and as far as I understand, uh, the robots that we have today are very very primitive compared that, to any so biological cool. organism. And the question is, why are they so primitive? And why can't they do the kind of domain general learning, even the limited domain general learning that the simple worm can do? This is one of the things that we are trying to understand. And we're, what we're trying to say is that when you're thinking about biology and you're, and you're uh, inspired by what you know about biology, you, you, you realize what huge affordances the vulnerability uh, of, uh, of living organisms. The very vulnerability and sens uh, sensitivity and vulnerability go together. The sensitivity and vulnerability of, uh, of, of living organisms, the soft materials they are made of, the ontogeny, the kind of affordances that, that, that sequential ontogeny gives you, provide. And if you want to build a robot that can do it, you have to, maybe you will have to implement something like that or find shortcuts that do the same things.